Let's read James chapter 1, verse 5 through 8. It says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that give it to all men liberally, and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. This is a very deep topic, I think. But we're asking God for wisdom. That's much different, I think, from praying. You can pray for the election. We're not really asking for wisdom there. We're asking for mercy. We're asking for justice. We're asking for a lot of different things when we pray for different things. We're not even asking for help. We're asking for wisdom. Because you almost have to ask the question, what kind of wisdom are you talking about? Deep wisdom? Are you talking about wisdom in grave circumstances? Are you talking about eternity-changing wisdom? When I think of wisdom, these are the things that I think of. Unutterable wisdom. Wisdom, as maybe Paul alluded to, groanings which cannot be uttered. Where God has to search the heart and examine the mind and examine the life. There's two types of wisdom as far as I see. Wisdom is the application of biblical precept, period. Wisdom is the principal thing. Amen. Therefore, get wisdom and with all thy getting, get understanding. When I say application of biblical precept, it could be something like the election. Let every man be subject unto the higher powers. The powers that be are ordained of God. And you can read the rest of chapter 13 and find out more information about how you should obey the government and how the government, when they're right, are there with a sword to execute justice and judgment against those that do evil. So please don't misunderstand that chapter. But that's wisdom. It's the application of that wisdom. I have many questions about Romans 13 from Christians. How do I exercise this? Who do I vote for? When somebody's evil in office, do I obey them? So I'm not going to answer that question. We can talk about that some other time. Another idea of application of wisdom is something like Acts 1.8. You shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Has he come upon you? Okay, great. Then you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and in the uttermost parts of the world. How do you apply that? I don't know for you. I don't know for the populace, but I do know for myself. For me, I'm supposed to be a pastor using the King James Bible to preach the word and be instant in season, out of season, and reprove and rebuke and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. I'm supposed to go out to the campus and own it and preach the word and answer questions and compel them to come in. I'm supposed to be in a ministry of sending missionaries and encouraging them and financing them if possible. So that's what it means for me. What does it mean for you? There's a thousand verses in the Bible that have a tinge of ambiguity in them. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Does that mean you? How come you haven't gone yet? Because you lack wisdom. Maybe it's not you that goes. Maybe it's you that stays. You stay by the stuff. Maybe it is supposed to be you that goes. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. So the application of biblical precept. We have a book in our hand. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Good works, there it is. Which works? Which good work are you supposed to be involved with for necessary uses? 
I don't know for you. Maybe you should have a podcast. Maybe you should go to Egypt. Maybe you should be a pastor. Maybe you need to be a prayer warrior. Maybe you need to raise children. I don't know. But I do know this. If any of you lack wisdom, you can ask of God. So I could talk a lot about the application of biblical precept, and that's what wisdom is. It's not just knowing things. Knowing things makes you proud. Applying the things that you know in a way that is most excellent and glorifies God and furthers the gospel of the kingdom. Now that's wisdom. Amen. The second type of wisdom I would call transcendent wisdom and all of its nuances. It's something so far-reaching that I can't understand it. There's nuances in your life, aren't there? Spiritual nuances. Sometimes I don't even know how to pray. And so I groan. I gasp. It's because it's so complex. Life is complex. We have a complex Bible. I believe all the answers are in this book. Amen. I'm not saying I'm looking for some ethereal answer that doesn't line up with the King James Bible. But what I am saying is transcendent wisdom is wisdom that comes from above and it's first pure, then it's peaceable, full of good fruits, without partiality. Sometimes I need that. You might need that in this trial that you're in. We talked about the trial of your faith being much more precious than that of gold that perisheth. You may have to count it all joy. How do you do that? Well, listen to last week's sermon, I guess. But also there's a God in heaven. He says, if you lack wisdom in how to deal with this affliction, ask of God. How do I build a church in these evil days? That's a good question. Charles Finney didn't have to ask the same question. John Wesley didn't have to ask the same question. It was a different evil. I don't know if it was as intense. Maybe it was more. I don't know. But I know I have to ask God, how do I build a church in this evil day? What do I do? Amen. What do I do differently? How do I approach the sin of this generation, the culture? What do I do? I don't know, necessarily. I can go back to the old book and make all the applications perfectly but there might still be some transcended nuance that God wants to tell me. And it's all in this book. I don't want you to misunderstand me. I'm not asking for extra biblical knowledge, but there's some deep things in your mind and in your life and in your heart and in this book that all need to interconnect in a very special way so that you have wisdom. How do I raise children? Well, train up a child in the way he should go. When he is old, he will not depart from it. That's a promise out of Proverbs 22, 6. What else do I do? Get your feet under the table with them and talk to them and train them. Exercise their mind and exercise their bodies and do a lot of different things. But I have another question. How do you raise children in this evil culture? I don't know. I just know to train them up. I just know to... Tell them to obey their parents, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. I just know the things that are in the Bible, but God, I need wisdom. I need something so that my mind connects appropriately with all the right precepts and doctrines in the Bible so that I can actually exercise my tongue. And we're going to talk about the tongue in chapter 2. So that what I say, how I approach them, and what I make them do, Turns him into a great citizen and a great statesman and a great Christian. Not necessarily in that order. A great Christian is first. There's a gift of the Spirit called wisdom. Did you know that? It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 8. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, and to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. These are things that God will give you as a gift. There are also things that are necessary. So I think that's why it was mentioned first. Because wisdom 
is eminent. Without it, you're a fool. Look at the book of Proverbs. It's talking about the wise or the foolish. If you're wise, then you're not foolish, and if you're foolish, you're not wise. Isn't that profound? So here's the introduction. Do any of you like wisdom? Have you asked that question? And where is it? What aspect of your life do you need help with? What are the deep things in your heart and mind that are captivating you and maybe arresting your mind in a wrong way so that you need wisdom to figure out how to get back on track? I don't know. I think the older you get, the less that happens, thank the Lord, because old people are supposed to be wise. They're not always wise, but they're supposed to be wise. So do you lack wisdom? This is the question on the table. And if so, what are you lacking? There might be old people and they lack wisdom because their body's breaking down and they're getting sick. How do I deal with that and still maximize glory to God and still have some effectivity in my life and do such and such things so that God is pleased? Things wind down, things wind up. Where do you lack? I don't know. Sometimes I don't even know where I lack. And that's why you're supposed to meditate in prayer and just agonize and look to heaven and think. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Praying in the Holy Ghost. God will tell you. He'll tell you what's wrong. He'll tell you what the issues are. He'll look out over this world and he'll say to you, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. Do you lack wisdom? Well, let him ask of God. The second thing I want to do is give you a few examples. There are my favorites in the Bible. This makes me happy to do that. 1 Samuel 23, 2. I'm not going to read the chapters. I'm going to try to be brief. It's a story of King David. And it's the most amazing story. It's transcendent knowledge because the Bible wasn't finished. So everything was transcendent knowledge back before the Bible was finished, except for what was already written. You understand the difference. If it was written, it's not transcendent, it's precept. If it's not written yet, it's transcendent wisdom. It's being given by inspiration of the Holy Spirit unto David. And so you jotted it down, and here it is. 1 Samuel 23, 2, David therefore inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go and smite the Philistines? So he had a question, what do I do? Everything that you do, whether you eat or whether you drink, do all to the glory of God. I think that's what David was looking for. He didn't want to just go kill Philistines just to kill Philistines. Do I go and kill the Philistines? Do I go make war with them? With good advice, make war. Can't get any better advice than directly from heaven. Hallelujah. He had a direct channel to heaven. Do you? Do you feel like when you pray, God hears? I do. I've seen the effect of that. Therefore David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go and smite these Philistines? And the Lord said unto David, Go and smite the Philistines. Some of you are very jealous of this relationship of David and the dispensation he lived in. In other words, you would want to know certain things where you lack wisdom, wouldn't you? You would like to be able to pick up the phone and say, God, what is the answer here? Do I go this way or that? I can answer the question partly. You don't choose between good and bad. You choose between good and good. Which way do I go? This good way or that good way? Don't ask God if you should marry a lost person. That's not a good option. Don't ask God if you should take a job at a bar. That's oh. not a good option. You might say, do I go work at this good place or at that good place, but not both? I just wanted to clear that up for you. I just love this. Go and smite the Philistines and save Keilah. And then in verse 4, Then David inquired of the Lord yet again. And the Lord answered him and said, Arise and go to Keilah, for I will deliver the Philistines into thine hand. I think verse 3, I don't have it in front of me. You can read it if you want to and tell me later. But I think there was some doubt about whether they should really go. And so David asked again, you ever do that? 
Are you sure, Lord, this is what you want me to do? Isn't that what Gideon did? Are you sure, Lord, I'm going to be the one who saves Israel? Are you sure I'm the least in the tribe of Benjamin? I'm the youngest. Are you sure, Lord? Can I put a fleece out for you and ask and tell you to do this so make sure that I'm right? Listen to me. We don't need signs for our prayers. Oh, I got a sign, a revelation. This happened. I get gold dust from heaven or some other nonsense. And this is my sign. You don't need a sign. An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. Amen. Unless you're authoring scripture, well, then you need a sign. That's what the Bible says. Just go read Mark 16, 20. And it'll prove it to you. Anyway, he asked again, and God again says, Arise and go down to Keilah, for I will deliver the Philistines into thine hand. And so he does. He goes and has a victory. Amen. A great conquest happens that day. Of course it does. You know why? He had wisdom. With good advice, he made this war. And that's what I would tell you to do. With good advice, make war. Don't do things on your own accord. Somebody said, well, I pray about whether I use Del Monte green beans or some other brand. Well, fine. I think you should go a little deeper as well. Keep doing that. That's good work. But when things really matter, you better pray. Amen. Where you don't have the answer, you better pray. If any man lack wisdom, pray. So he has his victory, but he keeps talking to God. Will the men of Keilah deliver me up into his hand? Why? Because Saul knew he was barred up and walled up into this city. And he knew that Saul might be coming after him. So he asked God the question, will the men of Keilah deliver me up into Saul's hand. Will Saul come down as thy servant hath heard? O Lord God of Israel, I beseech thee, tell thy servant. And the Lord said, isn't this nice? He will. He will come down. Wow, problem solved. Problem is, Christians aren't listening. Can I tell you something? If you would just take this book and read it through more than once a year, and circle every verse you think every Christian ought to know. I mean, every verse that you think is superior in its effect on you. And then you begin to memorize and memorize and memorize and read this book and pray. You'll have the wisdom you need. The problem is Christians aren't listening. Amen. Later on, we'll read in this same chapter, Be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Some people just listen to the message. They never go back and study it out like Acts 17, 11 says, that we should be noble like Thessalonica, the Berean Christians, where they heard the word. They heard it, and then they went, and they searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Now, there's some wisdom. God tells him he will come down. Okay, now he's got the answer. He will come down. But will the men of Keilah, these men that I saved? I mean, here's a conundrum that needs wisdom. You go down and you save Keilah, but then are these men cowards? When Saul comes with his troops, are they going to deliver David up, the one who saved them? I don't know. Do you know that answer? I don't know either. Do you know what's going to happen tomorrow in your life with such and such an enemy? Do you know what's going to happen with the election? I hope I know, but I don't think I do. But God knows. What do we do if the Democrats take over? What do we do if Biden allows eight-year-olds to become transgenders without their parents' consent? What do we do then? I don't know. But God knows. And if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. Then David said, Will the men of Keilah deliver me up and my men into the hand of Saul? Cowards. Are they going to be cowards? Are they going to do this great thing? And the Lord said, They will deliver thee up. But you know what? Saul didn't come down. You know why? Because David left. David listened to God. He listened to wisdom. And then he just simply left the city. And then Saul knew about it and didn't go down to Keilah after all. Isn't that wonderful? Imagine eternity was changed. There could have been souls killed. There could have been a great bloodbath. In fact, there would have been. But there wasn't. 
Why? Because somebody was listening to God. Somebody had a relationship with God and knew how to pray and was in tune with God and was a man after God's own heart and perfect in his heart, save the matter of Uriah the Hittite. Wow! This is what I want. This is the kind of connection I want with God and I can have it. The Bible says it in this chapter. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Amen. It's yours for the having. You just have to apprehend it. One of my other favorite stories in the Bible is in 1 Kings chapter 3 where King Solomon is praying and instead of praying for riches or for a long life, which is what most people would pray for, for victory and defeat of their enemies, wouldn't you like to make sure that nobody ever invades America like they did in 9-11? Wouldn't that be great? Just pray and God says, okay, that's what I'll give you. But that's not what he asked for. He said, give therefore, this is 1 Kings 3, 9, give therefore thy servants an understanding heart. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom and with all thy getting, get understanding. Amen. I want an understanding heart. To do what? To judge thy people that I may discern between good and bad, for who is able to judge this, thy so great a people? Look at the complexity of just your family. The nuances, the attitudes, the characteristics, the responses, good or bad, the mind they have, the decisions they make. And that's just a family of five or three or two. How about this by so great a people? How about America? And you're in charge of just a little lintel field. You need wisdom. And that's what he was asking for. We often don't pray for wisdom. But that's what he asked for. And God didn't just give him wisdom. He says, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God who give it to all men liberally. You know what liberal is? Well, we call liberalism. Anything goes, but liberal in the right sense is it pours over. David said, my cup runneth over. Wisdom. I have more than I can handle, I guess. More than my brain can actually apprehend. I mean, it just keeps coming. It's available. You have the Holy Spirit. There's no limits. We have the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ inside of us. Amen. Is there any lacks there? No. So that's what he prays for. We would do well to drop the laundry list of all of our wants. Because you already have all that you need according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. I'm not saying that you shouldn't pray for certain things or Del Monte versus some other brand, that's fine. But you would do well to drop the laundry list in lieu of this great examination of your heart and asking God, Lord, see my heart, search my heart, and know if there's any wicked way in me. Search all my thoughts, the secret springs, the motives that control, the chambers where polluted things hold empire over soul. Throw light into the darkened cells where passion reigns within. Quicken my conscience till it feels the loathsomeness of sin. Amen. I think that's what he was saying. Lord, give me wisdom. Who is able, who is able to judge this by so great a people? Who can do it without God? Who can run a country like America without God? Who can make good rational decisions about children in this wicked generation without God? Who can get through a terrible infirmity without God? Nobody can. That's why the world is committing suicide in a pandemic. And they're taking drugs and they're trying to escape reality. Not Christians. Amen. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Amen. If you lack wisdom, ask God. That's what it says. The last favorite I have, which might be one of my extra favorites. Maybe I saved the best for last. In 2 Chronicles chapter 20, with a great man by the name of Jehoshaphat, which had some problems with his affinities for 
uh, the kings of Israel. Aside from that, I won't talk too much about that today, maybe not at all. But he was a great man, and he made a great statement. There was a, a great troop of Amorites and Moabites and some other people that the Amorites invited to come and fight against him. And I would say he was scared to death. Have you ever been there? He had great fear. Sometimes it's warranted to have some fear. Now, the Bible says, fear not. Somebody told me it says, fear not 365 times, one time for every day of the year. I've never been able to verify that, but you can go check it out. Perfect love casteth out fear. But there's sometimes where you have to admit that you don't know what to do, and nobody likes uncertainty. We don't like the election because we don't want to wait until Tuesday to find out if evil takes over our country or if good remains. It's uncertainty, so we're all a little apprehensive, aren't we? I know I'm dating this message by talking about the election, but that's okay. Okay, so he's in big trouble. You know, we read these Bible verses, at least I do sometimes, without the right perspective. This was not a small matter. This is the equivalent of maybe Russia and ISIS, and they're all flying in with their war planes. Maybe some of them have nuclear weapons on them, and they're coming in to decimate America because they hate us. And that's sort of what's going on here. Now, how would you feel if you knew that was happening at this hour? If you knew that the communist news network, CNN, put it on their airwaves that the Russians are coming and the ISIS is coming. They probably wouldn't announce it. They'd probably say our friends are coming. Maybe Fox News might tell you the truth. I'm not sure. But aside from that, if they announced that this morning, wouldn't you have a little apprehension or a lot of apprehension? This is the situation. Do you see how sometimes you need extra wisdom? I mean, have you ever experienced that? I wasn't there when Pearl Harbor was bombed. I wasn't there. I was here in 2011 when the planes hit the towers. I remember how I felt. I was very apprehensive. I didn't know what to do. What do I do in this situation? Can I do anything? We, well, yeah, sure, just pray. Sure enough, that's what we did. But, I mean, sometimes you need extra wisdom. Jehoshaphat here says, Oh, our God. When you start a sentence with the word, Oh, there's usually some feeling there. Oh, our God. Wilt thou not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that cometh against us. And I love this statement because this epitomizes what we lack in wisdom. Neither know we what to do. Isn't that the issue? I mean, that's why knowledge is great. But is there a playbook for this? When the Amorites and the Moabites and the Amorites get mercenaries to join, and it's such a big company that it's overwhelming. There's no playbook for that. We don't know what to do. There's precepts in the Bible, and we ought to know those. You ought to go race through this thing, because you may take the Bible away from you. And there's another question. When they take the Bible away from you, then what are you going to do? What wisdom are you going to need? I'll tell you what you're going to need. A memory. This book gets in your heart. Before that happens, it might happen. I hope not, but it could happen. What do we do? We don't know what to do. That's the issue. But most of the Laodicean Christian minds, they're just in some dream world. They think that worship is going to a big rock concert and they sway their hips and they play their guitars and banjos and they get these famous vocalists to, to sing out these melodies that sound like like a love song to their boyfriend or girlfriend. That's their dream, you know. That's what they think about. But when it comes to deep issues like, what are we going to do if evil overtakes us? What are we going to do? How are we going to raise our children? What are we going to do about the church? What are we going to do about our families? How do we get them saved? It says here, neither know we what to do. But our eyes are upon thee. So I hope I gave you at least a sense of what it means to lack wisdom, because that's the question. If any of you lack wisdom, well then now ask of God.
it says that he gives wisdom, not wealth, not an answered prayer, <clears throat> not a thing, not a deliverance. Wisdom doesn't mean you get delivered. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth wisdom to all men liberally. Wisdom is information according to the precept of the Bible so that no matter what happens, whether you're being abased or whether you're abounding, you might need more wisdom in your abounding and in your abasing. Most people can't handle the abounding. They don't know what to do with it. They, they revel in it. The love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. The love of money. It didn't say if any man lacks money or wealth or prosperity or a fertile womb. He said, if you lack wisdom, I'm making this very specific because I want to use the words of the Bible, not what people fill into the Bible, because many extort this verse to say something it doesn't say. Because it ends by saying he gives liberally. God's a liberal God. In what respect? This verse is a prayer for wisdom, not a prayer for satisfaction or a prayer for vindication or a prayer for your future or prayer. It's wisdom. Now, it may affect those areas, of course. This God gives wisdom to all men liberally. What happened with Solomon, didn't it? He didn't just get a little wisdom, he got a lot of wisdom. I just wonder what happened at the end. I'll tell you what happened. You can go read Nehemiah chapter 13. Outlandish women did Turn his heart away from the Lord. You might need wisdom on that, boys. I mean, this book's full of wisdom. I want you to memorize Proverbs chapter 4, and there's about 10 verses there. And then there's Proverbs chapter 7, and there's Proverbs chapter 5, and there's probably a dozen or so verses within each of those chapters you ought to memorize. You know why? Because here's a man who got wisdom liberally, and then he squandered it. He should have been asking for wisdom about his own dirty heart and his own mind of ambition. You know, you need a lot of wisdom in a lot of different areas. But he gives it liberally. I don't think he gives you wisdom you don't ask for. Maybe that's why Solomon let these outlandish women draw him down into destruction. Hey, you know your own heart, don't you? Right? You know the things that sometimes captivate your mind in the wrong way, don't you? You know the things that draw you away, you avoid them, but you need wisdom. You need to understand the dynamics, spiritual dynamics, the devilish things, the principalities, the powers that are involved. How are you going to deal with all this stuff? He gives you liberal wisdom if you'll ask him. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 8, verse 11, for wisdom is better than rubies. I mean, we can go back to Proverbs chapter 30. It says women who are virtuous, their price is far above rubies. I mean, there's a soul. There's a woman who can actually do something with her hands and her husband is praised in the gate and her children rise up and praise her and she's full of dynamicism and she's full of love and she knows how to do such and such things. She's pure in her heart. Wow, that's far above rubies. Well, listen, if you're a man or you're a woman, wisdom is far above rubies. Wisdom is like that woman who everybody recognizes as pure and productive and lovely. Well, that's what wisdom is. By me, kings reign and princes decree justice, Proverbs 8, 15. Kings utilize wisdom and princes decree. They make decrees, good decrees, because they know what to do, because they've got their mind around the problems and they understand the dynamics of it. They know the information and it's all put together so that they can decree justice and kings can rule by it. 
The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 7.12, for wisdom is a defense. When you talk about the full armor of God, if you don't have wisdom, you have nothing. It's the first in the fruit of the Spirit. Wisdom. It's something you ought to be praying for. We ought to be praying for the gifts and calling of God that are without repentance. Once you get it, He doesn't take it away. Praise the Lord. Wisdom is the defense. And money is the defense. He's making a contrast here. Sure, money's a defense. The more money you have, the harder it is for anybody to penetrate your city. But wisdom is better. You remember in the book of Ecclesiastes, there was a man, a very poor man, and he, by his wisdom, he saved the city. Yet that poor man was not recognized by anybody, but he still saved the city. Who cares about the recognition? Money is a defense, yeah, that's true. But the excellency of knowledge is that wisdom giveth life to them that have it. Amen. Now there's a statement for you. You know what you need? Wisdom. That Jesus Christ died for your sins on the cross of Calvary. Wisdom that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Wisdom that his blood atonement is the only satisfaction for the anger of God against you. Wisdom is that you need to follow Him in righteousness and holiness all the days of your life. Amen. Now there's wisdom. And last, I want to tell you the consequence of not going after what I'm talking about today. It says in verse 6, of James chapter 1, but let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. I say to you, if you're not asking in faith, you're not looking for wisdom. If you don't believe that God is, He exists. Amen. And He's a reward of them that diligently seek Him. If you don't believe that, you're double-minded. You're wavering in your thoughts. You can Hang up your prayer meeting with God, because it won't matter. He will not hear. It says, but let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. It's not good enough to pray one day believing and the next day doubting. No. Doubting for what? My, isn't there enough evidence in the universe to know that God exists? I say yay. I look out at the Pleiades and Orion and Arcturus, and I see the complexity of the universe, and I see the fine-tuning of the, all the attributes of creation, and my, I have no doubt in my mind. There's not one shred of doubt in my mind that God exists. When I look at the DNA, 3.5 billion nucleotide bases, I believe God exists. Amen. Let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. Why would you? I could go on for an hour talking about the beautiful things that God has done. Spread out the heavens like a curtain and like a tent for men to dwell in. And then you go ask Einstein, what does the universe look like? He said, it looks like a curtain or it looks like a saddle. A tent for men to dwell in. There's no doubt in my mind God exists. And therefore, if I lack wisdom, I'm going to ask of God. Nothing wavering. He goes on to say, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. You ever been on the waves? I hate the sea. I'm vindicated in saying that because there's not going to be any sea in heaven. Praise the Lord. I mean, I love the beauty of looking at a sea, the waves crashing on the shore and all that. That's a whole different thing. But you get me on a boat out there, I'm going to be sick as a dog. And a dog would be probably a shame for me to say that because I would be so sick it would look worse than a dog. You know what it's like when you doubt like a sick man on a ship? That's what it looks like to God. You're just sickening. Wow. It says here, He that wavereth is like a wave driven of the sea and tossed. And let me remind you of Isaiah chapter 54. He says, There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. You know why? Because they're like the miry sea drumming up all of its dirt and mire. And there is no peace. You know what gives me peace? Believing, Amen. trusting, confidence, which hath a great recompense of reward, benignity, 
not being daunted by the troubles and the tumults and the perplexity. Within the veil, thy spirit deeply anchored, thou walkest calm above a world of strife. Within the veil, thy soul with him united shall live on earth his resurrection life. Let him ask in faith nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. The Bible says in Ephesians that we henceforth be no more children being tossed about with every wind of doctrine and all that nonsense. Henceforth, from now on, it's a new game. I'm going to yeah. trust God and believe that all the promises of God are in Him. Yea, and in Him, amen, unto the glory of God by us. I want to close with a little lesson on how to pray. Matthew 21, 21 to verse 22. Jesus answering said unto them, Verily I say unto you, I want you to listen very closely. If ye have faith, if you've activated your faith, your mind has been convinced without any doubting, no wavering. If you have faith and doubt not, now there's a definition of faith. Faith is you believe and you don't doubt. So if you're having problems with your faith, let's talk. But here's the definition. If ye have faith and doubt not, ye shall not only say, that which is done to the fig tree, because Jesus cursed the fig tree and it just quickly withered away. Of course, he's God. You can do that. They were astonished by this. Why? I don't know why. Can you figure it out? I mean, he's raising people from the dead and he's healing the sick. He's spitting on the ground and making clay and healing people's blindness. And people are leaping and jumping. They're a little astonished by him cursing a fig tree and it withers away quickly. But he did it because he wanted to make a point. And here's the point. You shall not only do this, which is done to the fig tree, but also if you shall say to this mountain, now there is something. I mean, a mountain. Is that the Franklin Mountains in El Paso, Texas? Is that the Mount Everest? Is that the Swiss Alps? I don't know. But he said, you can say to this mountain, does this stretch your faith a little bit? I mean, is this too much? No. no. Be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea. It shall be done. Amen. I believe that. I might spiritualize a little bit here in this modern culture and generation and say, there's mountains all right, LGBT, and children being raised under a very evil generation and culture. These are mountains. These are things that are insurmountable, it seems. I'll tell you something, if you lack wisdom concerning these things, let yourself ask of God and he'll give to you liberally and he won't abrade you and it shall be given unto you. It says, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea and it shall be done. Now listen to this, in all things, all things, whatsoever you shall ask in prayer, believing, you shall receive. Now, you can apply that to wisdom because he says, if you lack wisdom and ask of God, he'll give to all men liberally and abrade not. But let not that man waver or be double-minded. Because this is more important than just about anything else. To get that mind collected to know what to do in certain circumstances that are very volatile or very hard or very, very special for a time of life, for a stage of, of your Christianity, for many different things. This is a very important issue indeed. We lack wisdom and we don't get it. We're in trouble because things are going to happen in our life that we're going to need answers to. And he says, if you lack wisdom, just ask and you'll get it. But don't doubt. Nothing wavering. For he that wavereth like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Matthew 18, 19 says, Again, I say unto you, that if two of you, not the whole church, just two, get together with your best Christian friend and have a prayer meeting. It says, if two of you shall agree, you have to agree. There's got to be agreement on not only what you're going to pray for, but also what are the means by which you hope to get that prayer answered. If you want to be a missionary, well, the means are going to be you're going to go to do some mission work. 
if you want to save your children, the means are you're going to have to train up your children the way they should go. When they're old, they won't depart from it. And there's many different things, but you have to agree not only on the intent of the prayer, the purpose of the prayer, but you have to agree that we're going to have to do the hard work to get it done. We don't help God, but God expects us to do something. Two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything. Isn't that something? Do you believe it? Anything that they shall ask, it shall be done of them of my Father which is in heaven. Have you ever looked at these verses and there's a dozen or more verses just like them that I could regale you with and impress you with, I hope. I'm impressed by them. My, Amen. this is the absolute promises of God. I want to warn you here to say that we can have what we want if it's in the will of God. You can't have what is out of the will of God and think that you're going to get away with it. Your prayer meeting is over. I'm going to read one more verse and then I'm going to make a couple of closing remarks. I hope this will bless you exceedingly. It's in 1 John. You might know where I'm going. And it's chapter 5 and it's verse 14. And this is the confidence that we have in Him that if we ask anything... But wait, wait, are you listening? If we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. I tell you something about his will. He wants to fill your mind with wisdom and knowledge and understanding. That's his will, unequivocally, because he says it in James. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who giveth to all men liberally and abradeth not, and it shall be given unto him. Therefore, it's his will for you to be wise. Oh, that they were wise. Oh, that they were wise. Yeah, he'll give it to you. Not everything's in his will. Prosperity is not necessarily in his will. It might be in his plan for you. Just read Proverbs 22, too. He makes both the poor and the rich. They meet together, and the Lord's maker of them all. That doesn't mean you were going to be rich. That doesn't mean you're going to be healthy. That doesn't mean you're going to get such and such things. You're going to live in such a city and go to such a place. It might happen. If the Lord will, fine. But that's not revealed in the Bible. There's no verse in the Bible that says, okay, Pastor Mark's going to be rich. It's not there. That's probably why I'm not rich. If it was in the Bible, I would certainly be rich. I know that whatever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it. Nothing can be taken from it. And God doeth it that men should fear before him. Don't set your mind on these wicked things, thinking that you can pray things down or make things appear. That's nonsense. But he said, if you say to this fig tree, wither, it'll wither. And if this mountain be thou removed, it'll be removed. If it's in the will of God. Amen. If there's a Mount Everest that needs to be moved, well, I'll tell you something. You can certainly remove it by faith and by your prayer. No doubt in my mind. If two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. Let me close. Verse 7 says, For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. Lester Rolf might say it this way, You won't get one cotton-picking thing if you don't have faith. Nothing. Your prayer meeting is over what it says. In your mind, you think you're going to get something because you think it's a noble thing to pray. And you know you have dubious thoughts about the prayer. But you think that somehow God knows my doubts and he understands my doubts. He doesn't. He doesn't. That's what it says right here. Let not that man think, he's deceived if he thinks this, that he shall receive anything of the Lord. Why? I conclude by saying a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. One person wants to go this way, and the same person wants to go that way. It doesn't work. I want to be a doctor, but I also want to be an electrician. It doesn't work. I mean, I guess if you had a long enough life, you could do both of those. And you can go this way and then turn around and go that way. But spiritually, it doesn't work. A double-minded man is unstable. Well, listen. He that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul. This is talking about wisdom in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 36. 
or 8, verse 36. He that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul. If you sin against wisdom, you wrong your own soul. If you don't get your mind around these complexities and how to purpose yourself to do the right thing and understand from God, who's going to give you the answer, you wrong your own soul. All they that hate me love death. That's what it says. You hate wisdom or you're double-minded, you love death. You don't love life, you love death. So get wisdom. Get understanding. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom with all thy getting. Get understanding.